This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is libertarian legal giant Randy Barnett, who's just published his memoir, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. Currently a law professor at Georgetown, I talk with Randy about his days as a prosecutor in Chicago, how he helped create the legal philosophy of originalism, what it was like arguing medical marijuana and Obamacare cases at the Supreme Court, and what he learned from a narco-capitalist Murray Rothbard. We also discuss why he thinks the libertarian movement needs an intellectual reboot and how his working class Jewish upbringing in Calumet City, Illinois, remains central to his identity. Here is the recent interview with Randy Barnett. Uh, Randy Barnett, author of A Life for Liberty. Uh, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me, Nick. I always look forward to our conversations. I've been looking forward to this one ever since you invited me. So let's start where you begin the book, which uh, is in a kind of cinematic uh, uh, way, uh, where you're about to appear before the Supreme Court for Gonzalez v. Rach, the uh, 2005 uh, Supreme Court case about medical marijuana in California. Um, what is what were the stakes in that case? Uh, you know, set the scene for us. Right. Well, well the reason I start there, and the book is, uh, which is a memoir, is constructed as kind of a fractured narrative. Because if you start a memoir saying, oh, I was born in a log cabin. and I've already tale, fallen oh, asleep. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you got to g- give the readers some stake. Uh, in the story. And the first, my first big splash uh, as a Supreme Court litigator was arguing the Rage case, a lawsuit that I helped bring uh, along with two other lawyers on behalf of uh, Angel Rage and Diane Monson. Um, what was at stake uh, were two things. One is simply uh, establishing limits on congressional power right. um, so that it wouldn't be the case that under the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause, Congress can do whatever it wants to do. Right. Um, it has to operate within the lines. And in applying the Controlled Substances Act to two, two individual women who in one case was growing it for herself and another case had a caregiver growing it for her at no mm-hmm. charge, uh, it seemed to be a big overreach. Uh, especially when that activity had been uh, legalized and approved by the state of California when they passed their Compassionate Use Act. So the goal here was a policy goal of protecting medical marijuana use. Um, And in fact, you know, even though we lost this case, and not to Mm -hmm. give it away, but we lost this case, nevertheless, by providing my client, Angel Rach, with a platform, it really significantly altered the perception of medical marijuana going forward. Well, when she I was start, a, an exceptionally uh, sympathetic uh, character. And eager for the spotlight yeah. as well. Unlike Diane Monson, who was a very private person right. and not eager for the spotlight, as yeah. I described. Talk, um, can we uh, zero in a little bit? This this was a six to, six to three decision against Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, dissented, was joined by William Rehnquist, and then Clarence Thomas also had a separate uh, dissent. But what was you know at stake or the way that it was talked about is that if you know uh, basically the supreme court or congress was saying the federal government using the commerce clause can regulate all sorts of behavior even stuff you know where you're talking about this was weed that was being grown and gifted to people or grown by themselves it's not entering interstate markets or anything like that right um how did the supreme court you know, majority come up with a way of saying, now this counts as interstate commerce, which is duly regulated by Congress. Right. Well, the first thing one has to realize that when it comes to all of these commerce clause cases, so-called commerce clause cases dating back to the New Deal, they're actually not commerce clause cases. They are necessary and proper clause cases. Mm-hmm. And this is something that I discovered in litigating these cases, which came to make a big difference when it, when the Affordable Care Act uh, challenge um, uh, or when, when the Affordable Care Act was was enacted. So the reason why that matters um, is because Congress is not claiming um, in any of these cases to be regulating interstate commerce by what it's doing directly. What it's saying is in order to be able to regulate mm-hmm. interstate commerce, it is necessary and also proper uh, for it to reach this intrastate activity, which may or may not even be economic in right. nature, much less commerce. Commerce is a subset of, of economic activity. Commerce is about the buying, selling, and movement of goods from one place to another. 
Economic activity is a much broader category. It would include, for example, the manufacture of, of goods, et cetera. Um, um, manufacturing or agriculture, you know, commercial mm -hmm. agriculture for a profit would be considered an economic activity that's not literally commerce. If you grow mm -hmm. the grain, that's agriculture. If you sell the grain or m ship it somewhere else, then you're engaging in commerce. So that, so commerce is a narrow subset of, um, uh, of economic activity. But what the Supreme Court had held in the New Deal is that Congress could reach activity that may or may not even be economic activity if it was necessary yeah. to regulate regulating the interstate commerce market, which in Wickard versus Filburn, for example, involved mm -hmm. wheat. They were trying to restrict the supply of wheat so they could raise the price of wheat to farmers. Um, once you realize it's a necessary and proper clause case, then it, all of a sudden the fact that the activity you're engaged in isn't really strictly speaking commerce, that sort of goes away. That's not really a barrier to the government. But in 1995, the Supreme Court drew a line for the first time and said that Congress could only reach inside a state to regulate activity because it was necessary to regulate interstate commerce if that intrastate activity was economic as opposed to non-economic. So now, talk a bit about the Lopez decision because that's, that's the 95 the case. case. And this had to do with gun-free school zones. And in many ways that I can remember, I had started at Reason in 93 when Lopez happened. I remember writing a small article for us about how this is it. Like Lopez, that's the linchpin. Like the, you know, big government is finished post Lopez. <laughs> Obviously not quite accurate. I, I quoted a bunch of legal experts who were on my side, but what was the Lopez case? And then how does that give rise to Rach? And we're going to end the interview talking about the Obamacare case, the uh, NFIB versus Sebelius. Uh, so we're going to come back. This is like a movie, too, you know, where the right. beginning sets up the ending. But talk about Lopez. Well, yeah, Alfonso Lopez was a student who brought a gun to school, violating a federal law, which made it a crime to have a gun within a thousand feet of a, of a school. That's the Gun Free School Zone Act. And the Supreme Court held that the act was unconstitutional because it regulated non-economic activity. And that was the first time the Supreme Court drew a line between economic and non-economic activity as a means of implementing the necessary and proper clause. They said mm -hmm. Congress can reach inside a state and regulate economic activity if it was necessary to regulating interstate commerce, but they couldn't reach non-economic activity. And because Alfonso Lopez didn't buy a gun, didn't sell a gun, wasn't in the process of doing any of those things, he just had it on him. No. that that was not economic activity. Now, the bad news about the Lopez case is short, is after the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional, um, Congress repassed the law and basically said, if you are in a gun-free school zone act with a gun that has moved in interstate commerce, mm -hmm. then it's against the law. And since most all guns have moved in interstate commerce, the gun-free school zone act came back again. That's a very bad doctrine, by the way, that moving in interstate commerce thing, but that's a separate question. So we were when the Lopez case was decided, we were uh, we we were already bringing this lawsuit. Uh, actually, it was a different lawsuit besides the Rage case. In this oh, this case involving Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, the problem with bringing that lawsuit was that inside the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, money and marijuana were changing hands, and that's not only economic activity; that's commerce. So as I say in the book, uh, my co-counsel, uh, Rob Rach, who was ultimately married to Angel Rach, hence the name Rach on the case, mm -hmm. um, um, asked me if I thought it would be a good idea to bring a lawsuit in which no money in marijuana were changing hands. And therefore, it would not be economic activity. It would not be commerce. It would not be economic. I said, that would be a great idea. And he said, well, I have an idea for two plaintiffs who we could bring this lawsuit on behalf of. One is the person he ultimately married. Angel McClary Rach. She was Angel McClary and then Diane Monson. So we, and Rob and I and another lawyer, David Michael, brought this lawsuit because we were trying to bring ourselves under Lopez. And then while this was all sort of in the works, Morrison gets decided, which is United States Morrison, in which the court said we really meant it in Lopez. Um, Congress tried to criminalize or try to create a federal cause of action for gender motivated violence. And the Supreme Court said, well, because committing gender motivated violence is not economic activity, Congress can't reach inside a state and do that either. So we argued that Angel and Diane were engaged in non-economic activity, growing it for themselves, and therefore Lopez and Morrison applied and they could uh, do what they did. So that so that's what we were trying to do. And um, 
there was unfortunately a little escape valve, a safety valve in the Lopez case that the government could seize upon, as I talk about in the book. And that is that in Lopez, Chief Justice Rehnquist says, well, you know, the Gun-Free School Zone Act is kind of a one-off statute standing by itself. It's not as though it's an essential part of a broader regulatory scheme that's aimed at interstate commerce. So they, he says that stuff, and it, you know, it, it, you know, Lopez wasn't a part of a broader regulatory scheme, and Morrison wasn't part of a broader, broader regulatory scheme. But obviously, the Controlled Substance Act is a broader regulatory scheme. So then the issue is, can Congress reach inside a state and reach non-economic activity if doing so is essential to a broader regulatory right. scheme? Now, the way we lost the case, and we lost the case for different reasons, depending on if you look at the majority opinion or if you look at Justice Scalia's concurring opinion. The majority opinion said, oh, no, no, Lopez doesn't apply here because we looked up a Webster's 1966 dictionary definition of economic. And in there, it said the production of fungible goods is an economic activity. And since Angel and and uh, Diane were engaged in fundamental the the production of fundamental good of of uh, fungible goods, they were engaged in economic activity, and therefore we lose because Lopez didn't apply. Justice Scalia took a different tack, and his tack uh, said, "No, this is really a necessary and proper clause case," and he was right about that. And under the necessary and proper clause, Congress can reach inside a state if it's necessary. And it's necessary if it's essential to a broader regulatory scheme, like Lopez says. And here is the kicker. We already knew that. And I argued the case that way. But what we said is we're entitled to a hearing in which it's determined by a court that it's necessary, that it's essential to a broader regulatory scheme to reach this result. Sure, Congress can do it, but they've got to establish it's actually essential. And that's what Scalia went the other way on. He said, yeah, and you talk about how, you know, the fact is, is that the state of California already had a regulatory scheme in place to keep marijuana that's being used medically and non-commercially from entering, you know, leaving the state or entering into markets and things like that. The most important thing that the California regulatory scheme did is it designated who could legally have this and for what purpose. So if you're caught with a fungible good, you know, marijuana, and you say, hey, no, you can't prosecute me because I'm a medical user authorized by the state of California, you know, present your ID card and show that's true. And then you get out. It, it, the marijuana doesn't have to be special. What has to be special is you. Um, and But the court didn't buy that. And what Justice Scalia said is a re- Congress could rationally have decided that this, they needed to do that, even though it never even considered it. And so he used essentially judicial restraint and judicial deference to reach his result. Now, and what that, we, you're, you're, you get steamed, right? When justices are restrained. Um, but Scalia and Scalia's response, because going into this, you would have thought, or most people would have thought, like if Scalia is not going to just, you know, be an anti-drug conservative from a jurisprudence, a jurisprudential perspective, he's got to be on the side of Rach. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're I mean, this was disappointing, right? His his decision in this case. Or it it was disappointing. Uh, it wasn't a huge shock uh, going into the lawsuit. We had to be able to hold all five conservative justices because we had no shot at the progressive justices, notwithstanding the sympathy for our clients and their cancer patients, et cetera. Right. And it comes out of California and the Ninth Circuit and all this sort of stuff. You would think we'd had a shot at some of the progressives, but we didn't. We had to hold all five conservatives. And as I describe in the book, it was my theory at the time, and it remains my theory, I have some confirmation of this, that the Ninth Circuit was essentially running a game on the conservative justices. And they were basically saying, okay, you like the Commerce Clause, we hear you. Now we're going to produce for you a series of really terrible fact pattern cases. And let's just see how much you like the Commerce Clause. Now, ours happened to be the first one that got there, medical marijuana. But right behind ours, teed up by the Ninth Circuit, the next one was going to be a single uh, photograph of child porn right. that was not e- economic activity. And behind that was another case of a self-assembled, fully automatic machine gun. Right. So if the court had ruled for us in our case, then, you know, then it would. Now, I think those cases were clearly distinguishable because none of those cases were authorized by state law the way our case, right. our circumstance was. Yeah. That was my distinction. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, you know, the, you know, Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit, I think, patched this scheme and uh, he won. 
He, yeah, and he, you I, have uh, an ambiguous encounter with him later in the book where you say, hey, you were playing us, right? Or you were, you because what was happening under the Rehnquist court, uh, you know, broadly speaking, was they were embracing federalism and it was going, it could be used for non-conservative events. So it's like, right. okay, here, you, here's a, here's a series of cases that are going to make you choke on your theory of pushing things down to the states. Right. And, you know, I think he made his, you know, he made his play and he won. And I think mm -hmm. Justice Scalia was sort of taken in by the culture war yeah. aspect of this, frankly. And uh, one of the, t the tip offs of that was simply during oral argument when he asked me if they're not doing, if they're not using this marijuana on communes. Right. And I had no idea what he yeah. was talking about. And it was only after the fact that I realized that he's probably thinking about the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, right. which is simply a form of business organization. But he's yeah. a cooperative. He hears communes and communes. He's hippies. thinking it's like Woodstock or Altamont. Like he, yeah. he had no idea where he was at that point, right? So I think we lost him because just, just, he, they got gamed. Uh, he, yeah. he got game. But one of the things that's interesting that I mentioned in the book is that the feedback I got after the Rage case is that Justice Scalia got enormous blowback from Federalist Society constitutional conservatives mm -hmm. who were really on our side. Uh, and um, I don't think he expected that. Yeah. And Justice Thomas, who was often and always unfairly, but often linked as kind of like, you know, Scalia's shadow wrote a really searing dissent where he was like, come on, if if the feds can regulate, you know, non transacted personal use cannabis that's legal under state, obviously they can do whatever they want. There's no stopping principle here. And that's screwed up. So that was right. a kind of bold moment. You talked uh, just a couple of minutes ago. You said, you know, even though the case was lost six to three, it did have a cultural effect. I mean, let's Take us back to 2005, uh, you know, medical marijuana had passed in California in 1996. So it went into law, uh, you know, into effect a year or two after that. Talk about how things have changed because this, you know, it's, it's reminiscent of the Kilo decision where the, the case goes against, you know, the, the, you know, the people that libertarians certainly want to win, but then there's a blowback and there's kind of a cultural shift. How, do, how did the Rach decision end up kind of actually pushing forward accommodation with state, uh, you know, le uh, legal marijuana at the state level. Well, right. When I started uh, on the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative case, I can testify to the fact that yeah. I, it was considered a crank cre uh, marginal fringe issue because that's the response I got to people I was telling I was working yeah. on this case. By the time we argued the case in 2004 and the decision came out in 2005, we were being celebrated. It was we were the good guys. Uh, yeah. against the bad feds, generally speaking, you know, beyond libertarian circles and even amongst conservatives who like federalism. So that's the blowback Justice Scalia didn't necessarily expect. But it was the platform that our case gave Angel Rach in particular mm -hmm. to go on all the media, Montel Williams and all the other media and, you know, talk about the necessity of using medical marijuana for her that really mm -hmm. changed the political valence around the issue to the point where now most states have medical marijuana laws. And there's an appropriations rider in Congress that Congress passes that restricts the DOJ from enforcing marijuana laws in any state that have medical marijuana approved. So we've essentially accomplished the policy result in part because of the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we accomplished, Nick, is that, and this happened again with the Affordable Care Act, is we defeated the government's argument that had it been accepted would have been even more broad than the actual rage mm -hmm. case. And that is they argued that anything um, that substitutes um, for something you can buy on the market is economic activity. Um, so just because you, if you grow it yourself, that's a substitute for what you can buy in a market. That means growing it yourself is economic. I strongly resisted that argument in, in, uh, in, my, in my oral argument. And I was able to actually at the only time I was able to actually fend off the justices, because the only ones that asked me questions are the ones that voted against me. So I had mm -hmm. almost all hostile questions was by saying, look, uh, marital sex in some respects substitutes for something you can buy on a market, but that doesn't make marital sex an economic activity. And it was at that point, we just changed the subject and went on to something else. That's why it was significant that the majority relied on the 1966 dictionary definition of economic rather than the government's theory of when it could regulate interstate activity. 
Do you have any uh, plans to maybe send a more current edition of the dictionary? You, you point out that somehow that 1966 edition of the dictionary constantly is being used. It's like, I don't know, we're spending $6 trillion a year. I think the Supreme Court can you know, buy or, or I don't know, you go online and use a free dictionary. It's but. somewhat legendary amongst constitutional yeah. law, law professors that for some reason they love Webster's 66, 1966 yeah. dictionary. We don't really know why how yeah. it became the, the the touchstone, but left and right on the court, that's the dictionary they like. Let's uh, discuss originalism, which is the school of thought that you are most associated with. And the idea, you know, at uh, at one point in the book, you mentioned uh, that Katani Brown Jackson, uh, the most recent Supreme Court justice to be uh, put on, on the court, has even said, you know, we're basically, we're all originalists now. What is originalism and why is it so important? Just to be fair to Justice Jackson, unlike Justice Kagan, who said that, yeah. Justice Jackson oh, okay. never specifically you. used the title to describe herself. However, her testimony, when she at, when asked what her method was, yeah. was entirely originalist, I mean, to the nth degree. I mean, it was the most careful description of originalist methodology I'd ever heard at a confirmation hearing. So that's the victory when it came to her testimony. Uh, originalism can be summarized in a single sentence. It's that simple. And that is that the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. Mm -hmm. That's what originalism is. How do, how do you get to the proper meaning? That's, that's the nub, right? Well, that's one of several nubs. Yeah. I mean, first of all, why are you back? There's two different precepts that make originalism a family of theories, not a single theory. And the first precept is meaning is fixed at the time it's the Constitution is enacted, the way it is fixed when a contract is entered into, when you write a letter, meaning is fixed at that time. That's a descriptive claim about how language works. The second precept that, origin that unifies this family of theories is the constraint principle, and that is that constitutional actors ought to be bound by the meaning that's fixed in the text. So the first is a descriptive cl claim about meaning. The second is a normative claim about what the significance of that meaning ought to be for constitutional actors. So the first requires um, uh, some attention to what meaning is. That's your question. How do you mm -hmm. figure out what the meaning is? And there's right. some disagreement amongst originalists exactly about how you do that. Um, but that's all a matter of description. And then, but there's the normative question that has mm -hmm. to be answered normatively. What, just why is it we should be bound? by the meaning that's fixed in the text. Well, let, let's go with the normative question first. Why? I, I, well, I have a, an idea, but you're the expert. Uh, tell us why we should be bound by laws that are passed. Well, that, well the, happy, the happy news is that there are multiple normative reasons that are not mutually exclusive for why the constitutional actors ought to be bound by the text of the Constitution. And I could just name them or I could try to go through them. It would probably take the rest of the podcast. Let me just yeah. start with the oath that each and every person who gains power under the Constitution mm -hmm. takes to follow the Constitution. Now, the Constitution is not the law that governs us, Nick. The Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. Mm -hmm. And nobody who governs us under the Constitution is gets the power unless they first take an oath to uphold it. Now, that's a promise. That's a better promise than most of us even make when we click I agree on a yeah. screen to obtain a download of something. Um, it's a solemn promise, and therefore, it's not the consent of the governed that makes this binding. It's the consent of the governors, the people that have agreed to it. Now, what would that oath mean if it basically says, I promise to uphold the Constitution, whatever I say it means? Mm -hmm. That's not an oath right. to anything. I mean, yeah. Lysander Spooner, the famous constitutional abolitionist, said that's, that would be an oath to nothing. So they have to take an oath to something, and guess what the something is? The meeting that's fixed in the yeah. text of the Constitution. So that's when one you, argument. yeah, and you, I remember having a conversation with you some years ago where, when you were in law school and whatnot, like, you know, l l legal scholars didn't really spend a lot of time looking at the text of things. That's and right. I, I remember hearing that. You know, my background's in literary studies, and it's like all you do is do you do close readings of the text and the historical context in which they take place. Or something, but like I still am staggered by the idea that like for a good chunk of your career, law was not anchored to like okay, this is what we're talking about here. It just that, it seems amazing. That is what the originalism textualist movement was about, mm -hmm. uh, and that is bringing the text back in and saying, you know, you're confined by the text. Now it's true, as it's going to be pointed out by critics of originalism, mm -hmm. and that is that the text isn't always precise enough to give you an answer in a particular case. That's actually uh, quite frequently the case. Yeah. 
in which case the text still limits your options. It's not like it goes away. Instead of you can't you can't pick A through X. You want, you're maybe limited to A through B or A through yeah. D. Right. So it limits your options. But even within the choice set, um, I believe that you're also limited to being faithful to the text. And what faithful means is true to the original function, the original end, the original object, the original purpose of why we have that text. Um, but that's a separate question than the meaning of the text itself. Can you give a, a good example of how, you know, part part of the uh, the cheap shot at originalism is that uh, you guys are trying to be, you know, uh, a kind of forensic psychologist, and you're trying to understand the inner thinking of, uh, of the founders or whoever when they were saying something. That isn't what you're saying. You, it, it's about what was the meaning, the commonly understood meaning at a time. What's an example of a law where applying originalist, uh, an originalist analysis to it really makes something clear in a way that had been obscure before? Well, if, if what I'm thinking, I, I was thinking about going in a different, slightly different direction okay. than this example, and basically uh, explain how I came to be an originalist in the first place. Okay. Because I was not an originalist, um, uh, even when I finally got dragged into constitutional law reluctantly as a being a law professor. I started off as a contracts professor. Before that, I was a criminal prosecutor. I really didn't want to go into constitutional law. I was actually not a, not a fan of constitutional law because when I was in law school. Uh, and I took constitutional law from Larry Tribe. I discovered mm -hmm. that every time I got to one of the good parts of the Constitution, be it the Second Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, the Commerce Clause, whatever, I would turn the page of the casebook and find that the Supreme Court said, well, that doesn't mean anything or that doesn't mean what you think it means or that doesn't stop uh, the government from doing whatever it wants to. And by the time I was done with my course of constitutional law, I was kind of done with the Constitution. And I was it put in mind of an essay that I had read in college called No Treason. The Constitution of No Authority by a man named Lysander Spooner, right. who figures importantly in my development here. And in that article, in that essay that he wrote, the only thing I knew that Spooner had written, um, he said, first of all, the Constitution lacks the requisite consent that even a simple contract would have. I have, think I've answered that question in some of my later mm -hmm. writings. But the second sub, sub, subordinate point he made is that even if the Constitution was perfectly great, I'm writing, it hasn't stopped the federal government from growing. It hasn't stopped mm -hmm. us from, from exceeding the bounds of the constitution. So it's basically been a failed experiment. And that was my conclusion after taking constitutional law, it was a failed experiment. So when I became, I, I went, I became a criminal prosecutor. And then when I, kept, I got to be a law professor, um, I became a contracts professor. Then I got dragged into constitutional law somewhat against my better judgment when I got invited to speak at the fifth annual student symposium of the Federalist Society mm -hmm. um, on a was a conference on the First Amendment and I was on a program on the ninth uh, I'm sorry on the on, on the right of freedom of association which I hasten to add is not mentioned in the First Amendment even though it's mm -hmm. protected supposedly protected by the First Amendment and I told the student that invited me, hey, look, Brian, you know, I don't do the Constitution. He said, well, you know, you're a smart guy. You can think of something to, to say for 10 minutes. And I wanted, I really wanted to go. There were all these big shots that were speaking. And I wanted to, I, I was an obscure professor at Chicago, Kent. I wanted to go. So I show up and I go there. Um, and my punchline for my talk was the Ninth Amendment, which I'm sure you've committed to memory, Nick. Uh, and that is that the meaning of the, that is the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That was right. my punchline for why it was unelected lifetime appointed judges could protect this freedom of association, even though it's not mentioned in the First Amendment. Right. Now, I sort of expected that this monolithically conservative Federalist Society was going to hate what I had to say. But then it turned out they were not a monolithically conservative society. They were a coalition of libertarians and conservatives. And I had a very warm reception. Then I had to go back to school and decide, what to do next, because truthfully, I knew nothing about the Ninth Amendment. And so I just knew what it said, but you know, maybe I should do some research on this. So I had my research assistant go out and find everything that had ever been written on the Ninth Amendment. It turns out it was a stack of photocopies about, about that thick, yeah. a little teeny book called right. The Forgotten Ninth Amendment. And I looked at this pile and I thought, if I read everything in that pile, that'll sort of make me the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. So I did that. And I became the nation's leading authority on the Ninth yeah. Amendment. When Robert Bork testified that the Ninth Amendment was like an inkblot, I was able to put that in front of all the projects that were already in, in the works 
that all came out within six months. Right. And it was a big demand for my work on the Ninth Amendment. So when he I, said it was an ink blot, explain what he meant by that. He said, um, you know, he was, he was badgered repeatedly about the Ninth Amendment, mm -hmm. and he had a number of different answers, the first of which were better than this one. But finally, he he said, Congressman, a uh, senator, it's as though there's an ink blot on the text of the Constitution. He said, that I would I would enforce it if I knew what it meant. But it's like there's an ink blot on the Constitution. You can't read what's under it. Judges should not make up what's under the ink blot. <clears throat> and even the Wall Street Journal um, the next day um, uh, editorialized against that. That, that. that didn't even make the journal happy. Um, and so um, it, it did create a big demand for my scholarship. But I was not an originalist. And the reason I was not an originalist at the time is that originalism had come under uh, intense academic criticism beginning in 1980, by, um, initially by a Stanford law professor named Paul Brest, when he wrote the misconceived quest for original understanding. Mm -hmm. And that article is noteworthy for two things. Number one is it's Paul Brest in 1980 who coins the phrase originalism. So the movement was given this label by this critic he, so he makes up the label, which, you know, he was very successful at labeling. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that's, you know, the Quakers, isolationists. There's a long line of, you know, terms of opprobrium that end up being accepted by the people who. Yeah, uh, the Democratic Party. Yeah. It was a yeah. term of opprobrium used yeah. by the Federalists against them. So, um, uh, so there, so, and the, secondly, he, there was no theory of originalism at the time. Right. There was a practice, but no theory. And so he had to kind of make up the theory. And he did a very nice job in reconstructing various theories. Now, I was persuaded by that article. I was persuaded by another article by a professor named Jeff Powell that originalism was a non-starter. I myself considered myself a Dworkinian, and that mm -hmm. meant I was in favor of what's called the moral reading of the Constitution. And according to the moral reading of the Constitution, um, you can, you know, you're supposed to make the Constitution the best it can be, uh, and that would mean the most libertarian it can be, let's say, within the yeah. constraints of what. Text well, when you're about. when you're reading it, when, when I'm reading Dworkin's it, as opposed to when Ronald Dworkin is reading it, who was my professor, and I tell I have a whole yeah. big Ronald Dworkin story um, uh, in the book. Um, so um, I was persuaded by this. But then I started doing work on the Ninth Amendment. Then I started doing work on the Second Amendment. The book tells how yeah. I got involved in working on the meaning of the Second Amendment. So what was happening here was what you what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. Hmm. I'm not an originalist. I don't I agree with the critique of originalism, and yet I'm really interested in the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment, and I'm really interested in the original meaning of the Second Amendment, even though I'm not an originalist. And all my and the and I have big audiences for both of these things. So I was primed for a better theory of originalism if one came along. And then one came along, and it came along from a very unexpected place. I tell the story in the book, and that is that I was teaching a seminar on constitutional theory at Boston University, and in one of the anthologies I had assigned, there was a footnote in one of the chapters to a book called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, published in 1845 by a man named Lysander Spooner. Yep. The same guy I read in college as a libertarian who had argued against the Constitution altogether. And I thought, what could Lysander, first of all, what could anybody have said about the unconstitutionality of slavery in 1845? And what was Spooner saying about this? So I had my library get me a copy of what he had done. And it turns out it was a whole book, a 280 page book. And then it was part of a six volume collected writings of Lysander Spooner. You know, who knew yeah. Spooner wrote that much? And in it, he was responding to the radical abolitionist who had argued that the Constitution was a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because it had protected right. slavery. And when in 1840, when Madison's notes, which had been kept secret of the convention, which had kept secret, became public, Wendell Phillips, who was William Lloyd Garrison's legal guy, a student of Joseph Story, a Harvard Law graduate, he wrote a book called The Constitution, A Pro-Slavery Compact, the Madison excerpts from the Madison Papers, in which he uses the evidence of Framer's intent to argue against the Constitution, against the, the legitimacy of the Constitution itself. Right. And, and this is why in that part of the abolitionist movement, it was no union with slaveholders. That correct. They you, believe you have to get out of the, the union of the Constitution because it is an evil document that sanctions slavery. Absolutely. They were called disunionists. Mm -hmm. uh, they were against the union. Uh, they also burned copies of the Constitution at their rallies. And that did not make them very popular, which is the reason yeah, why a lot of yeah. anti-slavery people refused to call themselves abolitionists because they didn't want to be associated with these crazy libertarians, which is sort of what they were. Uh, 
the uh, the first but American. But now experience. Spooner Spooner is doing a kind of interesting troll, right? Because he's saying, "What are, what are you talking about? The Constitution doesn't even mention slavery." Exactly, he says. We're not bound by the framers intent. We're not bound by their secret intentions in some convention they had and things they said. We're only bound by the meaning of the words they used. And he refers specifically to original meaning, yeah. not framers intent, against framers intent. Right. Now, this was an epiphany for me. So I'm reading this book and again, cognitive dissonance is operating in the background. I'm motivated to find an originalism that I like, even though I wasn't really looking for one, but right. you can see I'm primed for it yeah. mentally. It was I stalking you. And I see this and I think, wow, this is something I can, I do legal theory. This is something, it's a theory I can yeah. do something with. So I went to town and by 1999, I wrote in, in 1998, I published a piece on Spooner's theory. And then in 1999, I came out as an originalist in a piece called an originalism for non-originalists, an originalism for all the people who thought Brest was right and Powell were right. Yeah. But turns out there's this other originalism I dubbed the new originalism, which got a huge <laughs> play. Um, and that's when original meaning originalism got off the ground. Now, one more thing that's important to say, unbeknownst to me, Antonin Scalia was making the same argument to people in the Mies Justice Department under Ronald Reagan and telling them, stop talking about framers intent and start talking about original meaning instead. That's what we should be concerned about. So when I went public with this theory, I not by this time, I didn't know anything about that. That was yeah. happening in the DOJ I, or right. I wasn't this, part of this that. is before Scalia was part of the Supreme Court and everything. Right. This was when he yeah. was a circuit court judge. Yeah. But by the time I'm getting ready to publish my book, our Republican Constitution, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, restoring the lost constitution mm -hmm. in, in 2004, um, I, I knew that Scalia favored the same position. And so it was good for me to say, well, this isn't just Randy Barnett's position, but Nino Scalia yeah. himself feels this. And to this, and uh, as of today, Original meaning originalism is the dominant form of originalism. Mm -hmm. um, every judge or justice who's been confirmed as an originalist professes to be for the original public meaning theory that we put together, that, uh, that I was instrumental in developing beginning in the 1990s. I want to move on to uh, some of the personal details in the book because that, that's what's, you know, it's all interesting, but that's what's particularly new. Let me just ask though about Lysander Spooner. Isn't the original meaning of the Constitution, you know, as it was passed, is it is obviously a pro-slavery document. So how does how does that play into originalism? The way Good you're question. About it? In the beginning, for several years, I kept going back and forth on Spooner's conclusion about mm -hmm. the Constitution. And then after originalism theory developed to a, a higher degree than it was when I started, it became clear to me that Spooner was just wrong, mm -hmm. that the original public meaning of these clauses that don't use the word slavery was slavery. That mm -hmm. people knew the fugitive slave clause was about slaves, even though mm -hmm. it didn't use the word. They knew that other persons um, was about slaves, even though they didn't use the word. And so Spooner's method was right, but his application yeah. of his method to the constitution was wrong. So I think, I, by the way, I'm really glad you asked me that because the more I talk about Spooner, the more people think, and the unconstitutionality of slavery, think I agree with his yeah. conclusion, but I don't. I actually yeah. think, I don't think, by the way, I don't think the constitution was pro-slavery either. I think it mm -hmm. was protected. But it accepted it, right? Yeah. It, I mean, it took it for granted. Almost. Those clauses that were, that, that Spooner denied had to be about slavery were in fact about slavery and right. therefore that was their public meaning. Yeah. So to, if whatever that makes the constitution, that I think is true. Uh, so I'm glad you asked me about that. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Bank on Yourself, a retirement plan alternative. Most of us have been told the only way to have enough money to retire is to put your life savings into a 401k or IRA and bank on Wall Street. But if that were true, why do studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by a staggering 10 years? Get the truth and discover a better way to grow and protect your money. Bank on Yourself is a proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping you never hear about. It gives you guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income. With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go south when the markets tumble. You're in control and you get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and no government penalties or restrictions on how much money you can take out or when you can take it. 
You also get peace of mind. You'll know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day you plan to tap into them and at every point along the way. Learn the secret to safely and predictably grow your wealth every single year. Enjoy tax-free retirement income and gain control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash TSN and they'll send you a free report about the retirement plan alternative that lets you bypass banks and Wall Street and take back control of your financial future. That's bankonyourself.com slash TSN for your free report. Bankonyourself.com slash TSN. And now back to the Reason interview. So let's talk about Calumet City. Uh, what is Calumet City and why is it so important to you? Calumet City is the is the place I was the place I was raised. Um, I I was born on the south side of Chicago in Michael Reese Hospital, but I, when I was about three, we moved south to Calumet City. And what made Calumet City interesting to place to grow up with, and a really good place to grow up, um, is it was a predominantly Polish Catholic town of about twenty eight thousand. In in a in a population of twenty eight thousand, we had we had four Catholic churches. Um, and parochial schools. There were some Protestants on my end of town as well, but what there weren't any were Jews, right. uh, which I was. And so in my graduating class of 400, uh, there were and four. And what, what year did you graduate? Uh, high school. Yeah. 1970. So I was in uh, junior high school in the 60s when all the rock stuff started happening and was in right. a rock band that I describe yes. in the book, <laughs> pictures of me in this rock band. Uh, um, who knows how many, you know, it yeah, I, we could have lost you to rock and roll. That's for sure. It's like well, if I had yeah. been any good, <laughs> that would have been a bigger challenge. But I was never really fantastic. Partly because yeah. of the character flaw, I'm quite honest about in my book, and that is that I have a hard time making myself do things I don't really enjoy doing, which is practicing my instruments, for example. So Calumet City. So anyway, I was raised. I mean, so here I am uh, uh, because of my father, who is my first mentor and who is a political conservative and a really smart guy. Um, I'm raised as a conservative Jewish kid in a Polish Catholic Democratic town. Mm -hmm. So that immediately kind of put me outside the mainstream of that group. But then we went to, we, you know, I attended synagogue in Hammond, Indiana, and the Jews, which were not from Calumet City, they were from Munster and Hammond in East Chicago. They were all progressive or liberal Jews. And so I was this kid from literally the wrong side of the state line because Calumet City is very declassé. I was from the wrong side of the state line, and here I'm a conservative in the, with all the liberal Jews. So there I didn't quite fit in either. And one of the things that Murray Rothbard told me, uh, and the book talks about how I was mm -hmm. befriended by Murray Rothbard and he became one of my mentors. One of the things he told me early on was a thought that was not original to him, but he's the guy I heard it from. And that is that many intellectuals become intellectuals because they were not 100% part of whatever culture they grew up in. And by not being 100% part of that culture, they kind of can objectify and sort of see it in a critical way because they're not totally immersed in it. Like a fish doesn't know they're in right. water. Um, and so because I wasn't quite part of the Cal City culture and I wasn't quite part of the Jewish culture in Hammond, <clears throat> it just encouraged me, my contrarianism, to sort of be an independent thinker. Uh, and how, that's how do you, how do you manage that where, uh, you know, I thought that was very powerful actually, and it was, it was totally new to me really, but how, where you're not just being a contrarian or you're not just being a troll, like, you know, how do you, how do you limit, you know, a lot of the book and about the legal theories, how do you limit things? How do you limit exceptions to state power and stuff like that? Like, how do you limit contrarianism? So you're not just being a, a kind of reactionary jerk off. You know, if somebody says this, you're going to say no. Well, that's a good question. I suppose one way you limit it is if your other character flaw is that you want to be accepted by the right. in crowd, <laughs> which I'm pretty candid about in the book. That is, yeah, like, no, it was stunning. Yeah. One of my character flaws is I want to be accepted. And if you're a contrarian telling everybody they're wrong, it's sort of a not a great strategy to be accepted by the in crowd. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this creative tension between kind of wanting acceptance and in the case of being a law professor, wanting respectability as a law professor right. that does constrain a bit um, sort of how far off the deep end you really. But it is go. fascinating because this is, uh, you know, you you talk a lot about growing up uh, working class or lower middle class. And that was stinging in a way because to, you know, I mean, you weren't Catholic. I, a lot of the people, I guess, in Calumet City were of a of a similar socioeconomic status, but then you're out on one thing. But then the Jews in Hammond, uh, 
tended to be a little bit ritzier and whatnot. How did how how much does class motivate you, or you know, either class envy or class rage at certain points? Um, you know, talk a bit about that. I think it motivates. I, I, I don't think I talk about it in the book, but I think you're, you're right to point it out. Um, I, I'm sure it motivates me to some degree. I do know that we, uh, we talked about before we started the recording, I live half the year in Sarasota on Siesta Key in Sarasota. And Sarasota is settled by Midwesterners. And it's mm-hmm. a very kind of laid back Midwestern vibe, whereas the East Coast is settled by all those Easterners, of which I have never really felt a part right. of. Um, and that's part of it. That's part of what you're talking about. It's a sensibility um, and, you know, I'm kind of these days drawn to some of the populist stuff, not populism, but the idea that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I am in the elite. I certainly admit that. I also, I also tell other people who are anti-elite, you, you know, you're in the elite too. I tell all my students, if you're here at Georgetown Law, you're, you're yeah, in the come elite. Yeah. But that you're, doesn't mean I can be, I, I, I'm not going to be uncritical of the elite the way I was critical of my fellow you know, the people who were Democrats in Calumet City or the liberals who were Democrats in uh, in my in my congregation. So, well, it's um, interesting when you talk about your undergraduate experience at Northwestern, uh, which was a reach because you're the first uh, person in your family to go to college. Correct. And you're not going to University of Illinois, which is a great school or University of Illinois, Chicago. You're going to Northwestern and you're hanging out with a bunch of kind of wealthy Northeasterners where this is their safety school. but Assholes is the word, the word yeah. I would use. Yes, they were assholes. Yeah. Um, it was, um, yeah, we talk about, I talk about that. I, I, I apply, I, my aspiration was going to University of Illinois. Yeah. That was all I really hoped to go. It was like the best school in Illinois, as far as I knew. And then right. my guidance counselor told me that once he got my SAT scores, he met with me and he said, well, you know, with your SAT scores, you could get into Northwestern. And I said, oh, really? Where's that? You know, I'm on the south side, south yeah. suburb of Chicago, Northwestern, as yeah. everybody knows. Is oh, it's, it's, it might as well be on the moon, right? I thought, well, I yeah. thought Northwestern, you know, Northwestern United States in the great yeah. Northwest, Oregon, <laughs> Washington, someplace else. <laughs> no, it's in Evanston, Illinois. So I, I, my if, best friend if I, I may have a sidebar, I, uh, when I did uh, the PSAT and I did surprisingly well, and I come from a, a non-educated family. And I, as a result of that, I got a come on letter from the university of Chicago, which I threw out without opening. Cause it was any school that's named after a city can't be a very good school. <laughs> you know? So I, yeah. I was, I was feeling you when you were talking about uh, Northwestern. Um, Let's you're you're but you're father, right. When I got to Northwestern, yeah. I had to, do, uh, I had, I was really put upon, frankly, by these uh, guys from Scarsdale in Westchester County who were, went to school and high school together. And they were, they, they picked on me and, and because I was a middle-class conservative who liked television and that, none of that was supposed to be good. Um, and so they were pretty brutal to me for my, it made my first year of, of college pretty much. It uh, is hell. charming the way that you, uh, throughout your career, like always found time to watch the Rockford files when it was on TV and things yes. like that. Yes. So. Especially if, you know, when, but back in the day with no VCRs, you really had to be there when it was. Yeah. Done. It was appointment television for sure. <laughs> um, let me ask you about Murray Rothbard because, you know, Murray Rothbard, uh, called himself Mr. Libertarian and now a lot of other people call him that. You speak fondly of him. Um, what was the essential, you know, jolt that he gave you? What was what was so powerful about his presence in your life and his thinking? Uh, first of all, we all called him Mister Libertarian. He was yeah. known to be that by uh, us as well as by himself. You're right. Um, he called I himself. Mean, I guarantee Mr. you, he's the one who started it. Just right. like you know, he also uh, called uh, himself uh, Mister First Nighter when he did movie reviews for Libertarian Forum. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was his another title that he took to himself. I, I first read Murray when I was a uh, junior in college. And by the time I was a senior, I taught an accredited seminar, uh, student organized seminar at Northwestern on libertarianism. Mm-hmm. And we used For a New Liberty as one of the texts. We used him and we used Fr- David Friedman and the, ha- the Perkinses and the ha- Tannehills and Robert Heinlein were our texts. And mm-hmm. I taught this class in my senior year. Um, and I wrote a fan letter to Murray, um, uh, as I was heading off to Harvard law school saying, well, I'm going to be on the East coast. East coast is a small place. Maybe we'll yeah. run into each other sometime. And it was all of these detailed questions, which now if I get a 
letter like that, I go, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to answer this. Right. And he didn't answer it right away. Eventually he did, but it didn't answer it right away. Instead, he gave it to a person who was also becoming a first year law student, John Hagel III, mm -hmm. who was at that time the president of the Center for Libertarian Studies in New York. And John called me up on the phone and we met at Harvard Square and we had coffee and we got to be very good friends. And he took me down to New York uh, to see a lecture being given by Leonard Liggio at Fordham mm -hmm. Law School. And in the audience uh, of this lecture was Murray Rothbard. And that evening, I, we, John and I ended up in Murray's living room, as many intellectuals in those days yeah. did. And we were firing questions at him from the, that had been you know, fired at us by our first year law professors. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Murray. He considered me a protege and I considered him a mentor. And um, he and his model, he had a particular model of libertarianism uh, based on property rights that I found extremely compelling. And the first time I heard it when I was in college, my first reaction to hearing it given by a, a, a junior classics professor at Northwestern present this argument, I thought, well, this is what I've been looking for. This is rational conservatism because conservatism had no theory. It was right. just a set of positions and sentiments and, right. and stances. And that was the point, right? That it's not theoretical. It's it's an attitude and it's it's an anchor and, on the and past. It's, and it's still not theoretical. Yeah. I right. mean, to some extent, the, the national conservatives are kind of right to say that libertarianism is at the core of much li of conservatism because it has no yeah. other thing besides the libertarian core. Uh, so... I thought this is rational conservatism. And then after about six months of debating John Cody, who was this classics professor, meeting him at the uh, student union at Northwestern, I finally decided that maybe I was a libertarian and that these, you know, and I started changing my views in a more libertarian direction. Um, but Murray, of course, he was the, he was Mr. Libertarian. He yeah. was the gold standard of what a libertarian was and should be. And, um, very encouraging. How, how do you mean that? I, you know, I, I will say when I started working at Reason, I had access to their library and I, I was 30 and I came across For a New Liberty. And when I read it, I was like, fuck, if I had read this when I was 15, I would be Rothbard all the way. But it, it didn't quite capture me at that point in time. But what you know, what was it when you say he was a libertarian the way a libertarian should be? Because he was uh, he was attempting to be a systematic thinker yeah. um, that integrated a lot of things within a particular rubric. And uh, I like theories. I like neat theories. And uh, this was a pretty neat theory. Uh, and um, he was also indefatigable. He would go up against everybody. He would argue right. against everybody. And uh, he, he was a very charming individual also in person. He, he was jovial. Um, and, uh, it was a great fun to be around, frankly. Uh, and I have a picture in the book that I took myself. Uh, and I think if you have the review copy and you don't have the heart, do you have the heart? I, I have a, uh, I have it on Kindle. So I have all the pictures. Do you have the color pictures in there as well? I don't they're know. They're not colored. No, they're not. Okay. So. so there's a color picture insert if you bought the yeah. book and in the color picture insert is a color picture of Murray. I took. Uh, when he's posed, it's in Palo Alto and he's sitting by a swimming pool and he's in a yellow like <laughs> outfit with a, a table and a, and a phone to his ear yeah. pretending to be a movie mogul in, in California. Right. So, and he posed this way for me. To, to, and Murray's going to pose as a movie mogul because he was kind of a fun guy. Yeah. Uh, he liked movies and uh, he liked culture. Um, so. Anyway, um, he was, uh, and, and, and the lesson of, one of the morals of the book, as you, as you know from the Kindle edition, uh, and that is that um, I had a lot of mentors who made me who I am. I would right. not be where I am today. I would not be the man I am if we're not all the mentors that I have had over the years. And he was one of them. <clears throat> and so this was my opportunity to thank him uh, posthumously uh, for the impact he had on me. You you mention at the end of the chapter where you talk about his influence on you, you know, that you kind of lost touch. And then, you know, towards the end of his life, he, you know, started rolling with a kind of neo-Confederate crowd. Uh, you know, he had good things to say about people like David Duke and a kind of redneck populism. Do you think that gesture in him is inherent in his work or did something happen that kind of pushed him in that direction? Well, by that time, I had lost touch with him. And mm -hmm. so I had no personal knowledge of what moved him in the direction he was moved in. But I actually have read recently some of the last things he wrote. Um, he died in 95, and I read some things that he wrote in 94. And 
it turns out, I mean, apart from these other things that are not very savory, so to speak, yeah. he was actually moving in a populist direction and, uh, and seeing a, a cultural problem. He was actually b seeing the culture war line up very much ahead of his time and being on, in my view, the right side of the culture war as opposed to the wrong side of the culture war, which means he thinks there is such a thing as American culture and there's such a thing as virtue and vice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And he thought many libertarians were sort of libertines, uh, libertines the way we're characterized as being. He sort of saw that as being rel as possibly true. So he was kind of ahead of his time in terms of this populist movement. And it did attract him to people like Buchanan and other people mm -hmm. who really are not that, really attractive people. Yeah, I, uh, well, you know, let's let's talk about that, and then uh, we'll we'll end with uh, talking about the Obamacare case. But um, you know, to talk about libertinism versus libertarianism, you know, how, what are, what are we talking about there? Because it seems to me part of being libertarian and part of being American, uh, you know, and I think of libertarianism as not a uniquely American, but uh, you know, it's it has a rich American past, which is like. You know, you know, as long as I agree that you can do what you want to do and I can do what I want to do and we're not, you know, in the common areas, we're not fouling each other's nests like, you know, we're going to step back and be like, hey, that's OK. I might even learn from you the way you live the, your life, the way you worship your God, the way you play your guitar and vice versa. Um, what what is the libertinism that you are concerned about or that you think Murray was concerned? about? Well, more that he's concerned about, I think. Yeah. But. Um, we there was something going on when I let, let me supply one missing piece, and that is that after I met Murray, I became involved in the New York Intellectual Libertarian Movement. I joined the board of the of the Center for Libertarian Studies, and we put on Libertarian Scholars Conferences. And I wrote a lot of I wrote articles for the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and I was immersed in this very very um, uh, productive uh, discourse that was happening amongst a lot of different people. Um, and so that that was very formative. Uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. Murray Rothbard by himself, but it was a whole right. coterie of people that I became close to. Um, but one of the things that was being debated even then was something that was called living liberty, that if you're going to be a libertarian, you need to live liberty. Now, what does mm -hmm. live liberty mean? What did it mean? We were against, yeah. most of us were against this, but this was a pretty big deal. And that is that, well, you want to legalize marijuana, you should use marijuana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not just you shouldn't put people in jail for using it. No, living liberty is doing it. You know, you you know, if you know, sexual conduct should not be illegal. You should do a lot of sexual conduct. So this was this living liberty idea, which I think is something you could call libertinism. Um, yeah. And it's and it isn't what you just said. It isn't. Well, I can learn from you, and I have to be humble about my my moral claims. And everybody needs to find their own means of flourishing, of human flourishing. It's something more affirmative than that. Um, and it sort of glorifies um, uh, all kinds of conduct that may be extremely personally self-destructive. Right. Um, and so that was a strain of libertarianism while I was immersed yeah. in the libertarian movement. And I think, you know, it continues on in some circles. I don't think it represents the views of most int libertarian intellectuals that I know. Right. Whatever I agree or disagree with them about them about that, I don't think they. I haven't heard them articulate this view, but it is a cultural thing, and you yeah. know as well as I do that libertarians constantly are being accused of favoring things because they like marijuana so much they just want to have marijuana. I, you know, I, yeah, but I, I've always found that to be the cheapest kind of critique of you know of course. you just you you you're building this entire edifice because this one tiny piece comports with you and. You but know, let the and, record and, and also there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. Like right, if but let the record reflect now. that I have never smoked marijuana. Yeah, um, no, that is. No, I was a marijuana lawyer. One of the lessons I learned yeah. from being a marijuana lawyer um, <laughs> is that you don't want your limo driver to be in the movement. Right. That they will not go to yeah. the right hotel and they will not be there on time. That's fun. And then when you, they finally show up, you can you're sort of rationally concerned about whether they can get you over the Bay Bridge in safety. You will uh, try marijuana though once it is actually descheduled or is yep. no longer uh, part of the or the Controlled Substances Act. As that's that's what I promised Angel Rach, and I yeah. promised her that I would I would smoke marijuana for the first time with her because okay. she really wanted me to. So we'll have to yeah. see if I can work that out. Yeah, that might be uh, a bit complicated. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about um, the National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sebelius, aka the Obamacare case, because this kind of bookends the the Rach case at the beginning. 
This was, uh, as our departing president once uh, said uh, to Barack Obama, this was a big fucking deal. You came up with or you helped formulate the argument against the individual mandate. Take us back to that, because, again, you know, it's funny. You know, you're at at some point you're talking about stuff. You're you know, you talk about Barry Goldwater and it's like, okay, that's the past. But then when we're talking about like the Obamacare cases, it seems like that might as well have been in the 60s. It seems like ancient time, you know, just years and years and decades and centuries ago. But um, how did you how did you develop the challenge to the individual mandate? As, and by the way, Nick, because sorry. I share that perception, that's the reason yeah. why the book doesn't end there. And it has the whole <laughs> final part about how we got originalist justices, because yeah. if, if the book ended there, I would say, OK, the book ends in 2012. Yeah, the 12 years. Stunning. <laughs> yeah, that's so it's like the book yeah. can't end in 2012. No. So the last part of the book is about how we got a, an originalist judiciary, which yeah. you know takes us up into today. Um, and the, the rage, I mean, sorry, uh, NFIB had something to do with that as well. I, um, uh, this was a very accidental thing that I got involved with because I thought after the rage case, there was nothing that the federal government couldn't do now with the rationale that the majority right. and justice Scalia had, had created. And everybody thought that that was, you know, that went beyond Wickard versus Filburn, the infamous yeah. New deal case. And then the federal government decided to do something that even when I was litigating the rage case, we couldn't even imagine as a hypothetical. And right. that is instead of telling you, you can't buy, grow marijuana in your backyard, they're going to tell you, you must grow marijuana in your backyard. They're going to, you must do business with a private company, something that had never happened before in this country. Yeah. Um, and so, wow. Suddenly they're compelling economic activity. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Somehow under the power to regulate it, they can actually compel you to create it. Yeah. Um, that seems like a bridge too far even mm -hmm. for the uh, Supreme Court. Um, and But I still probably wasn't going to get involved in it that much, except for this strange thing that I was, I was a member of the blog that Politico had called The Arena. Mm -hmm. And the format of the blog was that they would come up with a question of the day and they would post it to everybody, maybe 50 people who were on this blog and people could respond to it as they wished. And the previous day, the day before this day I'm talking about, uh, David Rivkin and his uh, co-author, um, uh, had a piece in the Wall Street Journal about why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. And I read that piece the day before. It was in September of 20, uh, 2009. And I thought, well, if that's the best argument for why it's unconstitutional, then it, I think it's probably constitutional. Mm -hmm. um, it was not persuasive to me. But that was what we were supposed to talk about the next day. And if it weren't for the fact that there was this jerk professor from William & Mary a health law professor who got on and started fulminating about how no serious person could ever think that this thing was constitutional right. in the way that he wrote it. I decided, okay, I'll respond to this guy. And in the course of responding to him, I basically made the move that turned out to be the biggest move we made. And that is that this has never happened before. And if it's never happened yeah. before, chances are there's no precedent that says Congress can do this. And that turned out to be a very important argument. Um, you can't cite all these precedents that weren't about this because this has never happened before. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got, that was the beginning of my involvement in developing this theory about why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. Eventually, for the first year, um, because I was so associated with this theory that I, I put together for the Heritage Foundation, um, and uh, what the book tells a story about how... Um, the, the Republicans in the Senate, uh, w one of the things I learned during this is that senators have a privilege of, of making a point of constitutional order. And if you make a point of constitutional order, then there's a debate on the constitutionality of some measure. And we were told that the Republicans in the Senate were not going to make a point of constitutional order because they couldn't think of a constitutional objection to make. So Heritage, for which I wrote this policy, uh, um, a memo on why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional with two other people who were instrumental in writing that memo with me, um, they put on a, a public event presenting our legal memorandum. But then we also had a private meeting with Hill staffers saying, well, here's our argument. And they heard this. They took it away. The Republicans did make a constitutional point of order. Mm -hmm. There was a debate on national television. Every single Republican senator voted that it was unconstitutional, and we were off and running. So for the first year, being the author of this theory, 
I basically did consulting with all the challengers around the country. I made a point of traveling and attending every circuit court argument around the country so I could hear how the arguments were playing in front of different judges. And eventually, after the Florida court, the Florida district court ruled that Obamacare was unconstitutional, I was hired by National Federation of Independent Business to be one of their counsels. Uh, the job, my first job of which was to select the law firm, to help select the law firm that would represent them in, in the Court of Appeals and in the Supreme Court. So that's how I became one of the lawyers in the Obamacare case. What happened? Um, you know, and you, you go into great detail. And again, you know, it's recent history, but as happens all the time, you know, it just seems I, I, I already feel this way about COVID. Like we've forgotten. I feel this way about the fact somebody tried. I feel this way about somebody trying to shoot the, the Donald Trump. That's yeah, no, it, it's already, we'll, we'll never talk about it again because that's like a week and a half, that's you know, 10 ex- days old or something. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, um, you go into great detail about the torture, you know, the, tor- the, the way that John Roberts clearly tortured, you know, the meaning of the law and changed his ruling. And this, this was front page news at the time, but can you go into that a little bit and the import of, you know, what happened there? Right. Well, remember in Rach, we got three votes. You need five to win. We only got three. In NFIB, we had five votes. The five We had five votes, five justices who said individual purchase mandates are unconstitutional under the Commerce and Necessary and Proper Clause. We had five votes. Now, normally, if you have five votes, you win the case. <clears throat> if you've lost the case, it's because you didn't have five votes. We had five votes. Now, what happened? What happened is John Roberts, the fifth vote, said, "We agree. I agree. If this were a purchase mandate, um, it would be unconstitutional. And even though the natural reading is that it is a purchase mandate yeah. because it is a requirement. He's like a Lysander Spooner here. He's he's looking at the words and making something up. Well, he's not, he's not yeah. being as good as Spooner. Um, uh, he says it's a, per, it's a requirement enforced, even though it's a requirement enforced by the penalty, the natural reading of which would be it's a purchase mandate. For a variety of reasons, it's reasonably possible for me to read this as a option to buy insurance or pay a modest tax. And if that's all it is, then I can uphold it as constitutional, then uphold the whole law as constitutional. And that's what he did. Um, he bas- We established, we won. We established Congress does not have the power to impose purchase mandates on the people. They can't do it. They couldn't do it then. They still can't do it. If they had been able to do it, they could have increased the penalty to imprisonment for not having health insurance. But under under Roberts's theory, they can't do that. They have to keep a non coercive fine or tax. That's all they can do. So he doesn't specify like how high, like what's the threshold where he he said, you know, you don't have you don't owe more in taxes than you would have to pay to buy the insurance itself. Somehow that made a difference to him. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have a choice: have insurance or pay the tax. It costs you the same way either way. Right. Why and that? then you, I mean, you make a, a strong case that he was responding to a unprecedented barrage of kind of public and private coercion from the media, from politicians, from people around him. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's circumstantial, but one of the mm-hmm. things that we have subsequently learned from Jan Crawford, the reporter, is that he had initially voted uh, with the majority to invalidate the individual insurance mandate. And at some point during the process, he changed his mind into he was going to uphold the, uh, the insurance mandate as a tax the way he did. Um, and one has to believe that the unbelievable public pressure that was brought to bear from every establishment quarter um, would have had an effect on him who's known to be concerned about the reputation of the Roberts court. There's a lot of people who think that if he was an associate justice, he would be a different person than chief justice because his name is on the court and he's got this proprietary interest in keeping it legitimate and acceptable. And they just went after him tooth and claw. In fact, I did a podcast earlier today with Jeff Rosen um, of the National Constitution Center, who did a number on John Roberts, and we talked about this earlier. Yeah, and you you write about that in the book. You yeah, he said I, he made a cameo appearance in the book. And, yeah, you know, as part of a great conspiracy to change John mm-hmm. Roberts's view. And I said, well, you know, you should be proud of yourself, Jeff. You know, you you did a nice, you did a good, you were you were very effective there. Um, Now, what happened, though, is, you know, more quietly, because the Republicans, you know, who ran on uh, repeal and replace, um, you know, they they got into power and they did neither of those things, but they did got the individual mandate. So what are we left with in the sense of, you know, okay, so the IRS is going to enforce the tax or the fine or whatever we want to call it, but we still have 
Obamacare. Well, um, absolutely. How do we even make sense of any well, of this? Well, the way one way to one way to make sense of it is the the term uniparty, uh, and mm -hmm. that is that Republicans were never serious about presenting an alternative to this national program. Um, for two years, I. Whenever, you know, I was pretty big. I was a pretty well-known figure for two years as I was doing all the media for this case. And I went out, I was on the Hill quite a bit giving briefings and stuff. And I begged the people on the Hill. I begged them, everyone who would listen to me, come up with an alternative, a market-based alternative to this thing, because that's going to make it easier for the Supreme Court to invalidate it if they know once they do that, Congress is going to pass this other thing. Right. Um, but they would never do that. The Republicans would never do the work necessary to develop a consensus around what their alternative was. And then when it came time to repeal it, uh, John McCain, you know, famously refused mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and because, you know, they are the Washington generals up against the Harlem Globetrotters and their job is to make it look like there's a game going on. Um, but in fact, their job is to lose. And they do that quite well. Um, to close out, let's talk, and, and I want to uh, stress to everybody who's listening or watching that, you know, this book is a rich personal history with all of these, you know, public history moments that is, you know, it, it's gripping uh, and it, it's paced well, it reads well, all of that kind of stuff. Thank you. Talk a little bit about the libertarian movement, because, you know, one of the other things that's fascinating within the movement to, you know, when you're, you, and you've mentioned some of them you know, these institutions that were created in order to kind of create and develop libertarian thinking, et cetera. You know, you, you're 50 years into a career uh, and all of that. Libertarianism seems to simultaneously be more established and more relevant and also kind of still marginal in ways. I mean, how do you, how do you make sense of the libertarian movement um, or do you? Uh, I think it's been very influential uh, in the ways, in some of the ways that it's being accused of being influential by the national conservatives, for example, who make us out to be the power behind every throne here in, in right. Italy, which we don't recognize in ourselves. But I do think that intellectually libertarianism has been uh, influential, even if people aren't prepared to go all the way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the differences right now that libertarianism is suffering from compared to originalism is originalism has been the beneficiary of two and a half decades, or if not three decades of, of arguments amongst originalists about what originalism really is. We have been debating each other within the institutional framework provided by the Federalist Society and other institutions about exactly you know, how is the meaning fixed and exactly mm -hmm. what do you do when the meaning is not clear. And, and so we've been arguing with each other. And as a result, the originalism theory today is far more robust than it was 20 years ago when I first started announcing the new originalism. Libertarianism, unfortunately, has lost its institutional framework uh, in which you could debate libertarian theory with each other. We had that in the Center for Libertarian Studies. We had originalism. We had libertarian scholars conferences every summer. We had a journal. There, it was not a fixed series of, 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 of policy positions. It was an intellectual framework that we were constantly debating each other about. What, for example, were the rights of children? Why did children have rights? What kind of rights did they have? I mean, mm -hmm. they can't be contract rights because children can't enter into contracts. They can't be property rights because parents don't own their children like property. What could they be? What could they be? And George Smith, a famous libertarian who had a big influence on me, even though he was not a professional academic, said, well, there's this guardian ward model. And it's in the common law and it's the way things are done. And it's a consent based relationship, but it's not a contract and it's not property. You're guardian and you're a ward. And we go, oh, wow, the guardian ward model, that solves right. that problem, you know? So we had a robust movement, but that kind of ended. Do uh, you, well, why did it end? Or was that fundamentally, are you talking about academic or legal approaches to libertarianism? Because it seems to me in the cultural sphere and in other areas, I mean, um, these conversations are going on. They're often fraught and they are not, you know, maybe the difference is it's not people appearing at the same conference and talking. It's people lobbing grenades at each other. But is it, you know, is it a, a, a failure of academic institutions at this point? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm a law professor. I'm an academic. I'm a professional academic. And I have been since 1982. Um, I believe we serve a purpose. I believe I serve a yep. purpose. And I can do things as a, the as a theory person that I wouldn't be able to do if I were just litigating constitutional cases, which I don't do really. I right. mean, except for these three cases, that's not what I do. Um, and 
you could be debating against each other on policy grounds all day long, but that doesn't really rich, enrich the theory that you're supposedly operating from. And the premises from which libertarians have been operating from have been somewhat frozen in amber since the 1980s, since, because I believe we've lacked an institutional framework in which these debates will take place amongst professional libertarian uh, academics and intellectuals. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be an academic to be an intellectual. George right. Smith was not an academic, yeah. and he was a superb intellectual had a huge impact on me mm -hmm. um but he was deeply involved in the development of the theory and that theory just has stagnated now it's not to say that there aren't individual strains of libertarianism that have emerged like uh bleeding heart libertarianism and left libertarianism and paleo libertarianism there are people who are trying to push the envelope a bit but it's being done furtively and it's being done somewhat sub rosa uh, and i think that liber that originalism benefited from the federalist society in which we had conferences and all kinds of meetings in which we would debate each other libertarianism hasn't had that benefit and it it could use some updating it could use some rethinking that would actually involve capturing the truth of bleeding heart libertarianism, of left libertarianism, and of paleo libertarianism. Even though they see themselves as separate from each other, I kind of see them as each onto something. This something that can be merged into a bigger picture, a bigger theory. Do you, do you think some of this is, uh, you know, there, there's always been this um, tension between being theoretical and being practical? And, you know, the alliance of libertarians, mostly with conservatives or uh, is that part of the problem that libertarians give ground or, or they, they give up the theoretical approach when it, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've been told that Donald Trump, you know, and I, it, whether it's true or not, is kind of secondary, but Donald Trump was the most libertarian president ever. And like, if you don't vote for Donald Trump, you're not a libertarian or, and it's, it's just different registers really of like, okay, we're trying to have ideas here, but in order to be, to have a, an impact in politics, You've got to be either a Republican or a Democrat. And I don't necessarily disagree with that, but it's like it's taking us out of an intellectual realm and putting us into how do we win the next midterm election rather than. I mean, there's got to be a division of labor. And I mean, that's just natural. And people who are arguing in the academic sphere, they can have their political opinions, but that doesn't mean they're out there campaigning for a president in one way or the other. And sometimes you can wear multiple hats. I mean, in my book, it's obvious I've worn multiple hats throughout my life. But first and foremost, my core is being an academic and a theorist, a p political and legal theorist, um, starting with my book, uh, The Structure of Liberty, Justice, and the Rule of Law, moving towards today. Uh, I think my last book may very well be a book on libertarianism, uh, whereas that was my first book. Um, and I just think... Um, uh, in a division, healthy division of labor, there should be an infrastructure in which we libertarian scholars um, are have been exchanging our views um, on, a, on a systematic basis for the last 20 or 30 years. And it just hasn't been happening, at no. least not to my knowledge. And I think I would well, know if it was going yeah. on. Let's end on this point, because and I think it's really important. You you earlier were making an argument that ideas matter, uh, you know, and that ideas have consequences and that. Um, can you can you take us out of this conversation, you know, by defending the idea of intellectual work? Because this is oftentimes, I, and I don't think it's just libertarianism, but in ideological movements, oftentimes there is a derision towards ideas, which strike me, strikes me as very bad. But, you know, defend the academy from the people who say, you know, you guys are just pointy headed moochers who are living off the fat of the land. Um, well, again, I don't equate intellectuals with ac academics, but I think right. not all academics are intellectuals. Some of yeah. them are anti-intellectual. But right. uh, I'm going to give you two historical case studies of where ideas have made a big difference. And the first is the original libertarians in this country and the anti-slavery movement, which grew up in response to a pro-slavery ideology that was sparked by the invention of the cotton gin that made slavery, which had th formerly been thought to be kind of going out of business, extremely profitable. And along with the profit came a pro-slavery ideology. And what met them on the field of intellectual combat was the first libertarians who are arguing in favor of the liberty of the individual to own themselves um, and to direct their lives. And that was the first big libertarian movement. And it culminated in a civil war, a terribly bloody civil war that ultimately put an end to, to shadow slavery. Unfortunately, it then begat uh, a, a long period of Jim Crow laws. Uh, in which ideas still had to matter. But the point here is that we only got 
to the Civil War and the end of slavery because of the libertarian anti-slavery movement. And in their- And a, an intellectual movement that it, countered- Exactly. Uh, uh, an intellectual superstructure defending slavery. Terrific. Absolutely. Yeah. There was an intellectual superstructure on both sides, developing mm -hmm. alongside each other, arguing against each other. And right. by the way, the people that make the argument that this was the first libertarian movement very persuasively is John Tomasi and right. and and uh, Matt Zwolinski mm -hmm. in their book, The Individualist, right. which I highly yes. recommend. Yeah. Um, that was the first case study I would, why, why ideas worked out make a difference. And those ideas, by the way, then were translated into the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the Constitution. It was translated into the Republican Party. The Republican Party took most of the ideas on board. The second example I would give is the originalism movement, which started um, very inauspiciously by a uh, Stanford law professor coming up with the name libertarian, uh, uh, originalism, and then having to invent theories to refute because there was no theory. That was 1980. 44 years ago, to the point where we now have a majority of justices who identify as liberty, uh, as originalist on the court um, as a result of two things. One is a robust intellectual development of the theory. And the second is a political movement that whose mission was to eventually get originalist justices on the court, which culminated in Donald Trump making his pledge to put these originalists on the court as a way of solidifying the political support that he would have in 2016. He honors his commitment by picking Don McGahn to be his White House counsel, who then screens people for whether they're originalists or not, something the Bushes never did. Um, and as a result of the political movement merged with the intellectual movement, we now have made genuinely genuine progress in restoring the lost constitution um, in a way that when I was in Larry Tribe's constitutional law class, I would have asked you what you were smoking if you had told me that we were going to get this far this fast, much less that I would have some role to play in all of this. So I think that is the case I would make. Great. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, Randy Barnett, the book is A Life for Liberty. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to the next one. I, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to writing the next one. Thanks. <laughs>